What's up, Drop Pod listeners? As always, you can listen to the Drop Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Pods. We're now on Amazon Music, Audible, and Pandora as well. New episodes drop every Wednesday. You can also find all of our content on YouTube at the Drop Golf Podcast and on our socials. That's Instagram and Twitter at the Drop underscore pod. No matter how you consume us, like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff, follow and listen along. And Mike's been right about it this whole time. This is the Drop Podcast where we talk golfing in the Garden State. I'm Mike Poro and this is Ryan Kulot. What's going on, everyone? Another big week. Uh, we have an awesome, awesome episode for you. I'm really excited to be here and chat about it. Uh, but first, before we get into it, just want to remind you that our polos are available at flukeapparelco.com. We've said it before. It is August 30th, end of August. Polo season is just about out of, out of it. You know, you got maybe a month left, month plus if the weather holds. What are you doing? If you haven't bought one, go buy one. Flukeapparelco.com. Go get one. Go check them out. They're great material. They look great. They feel great. They're they're. A tad snug with that like athletic cut. So if you're a big guy like me, size up. If you're if you're a mini me like Mike, get a regular size. But go get them. What are you waiting for? All right, Mike. Let's get into the episode. Yeah, let me start first. Let me start first because I know some people at this point probably are wondering like, well, we never heard after I made that post on Instagram where our office was for that day and what did Ryan end up shooting? You know, because a few episodes have gone by and it has not come up in conversation one time. And this is the reason why, because we were going to dedicate its own episode to our day at Manasquan River, because I know for the past, however many months that we've been doing this, I've heard the line nonstop. Oh, Mike, by the way, you know, I never played there. Uh, And so now we can check that box about, Ryan has officially played one through 18 in order with a caddy at Manasquan River with the head golf professional, Chris Dimmick, with the president, Andrew Kelly. Can't thank those two enough, but I know that the post was something that got a ton of eyes on. And now we are going to circle back a few weeks later about the post itself because I, it got nearly 500 views alone on the post. Okay, so people were curious about where we were that day. And then all the votes came in. So you can only imagine with how many people saw it, how many people actually voted. And not for nothing, the bulk, I would say, the bulk of people had you going sub 90. And that includes sub 80 with some votes thrown in there as sub 80, which I was mind blown that people, no those, offense, those, would vote sub 80. Those people have not uh, been paying attention to what's been going on then. That's what that means. That's or, a slip or up. Those sub- that's a mistake. <laughs> There's got to be. They haven't been paying attention. That's what that's what that if, is. Uh, I appreciate I just assumed the it support. Was, but, but. I assumed it was you and your friends on some <laughs> fake internet Instagram accounts just clicking that button, you know. But nonetheless... The bulk of the people were sub 90. So I think it's it's only you know fair to the audience that we talk a lot about your day there because obviously we we've harped on this at nauseum to some extent. I'm sure for a lot of listeners, my perspective about the golf course. And I know that you made a comment out on the golf course to Andrew and Chris mm-hmm. about something. That you don't like to admit too often, I, I, I but do. I sure as hell love I sure as hell love hearing it. So I think for the audience listening to this episode, I think it's very important that you kind of say that line again so we can all hear it. I, I was I was gonna open up with it because you deserve it. Mike was right. He's been saying how special Manasquan is. He's been saying how wonderful the course is. He's been talking about the facilities. He's been talking about the people there. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, guys. He is. He's. He's right. And I hate to admit it, because uh, because I hate to. I hate to. You know. I don't want to give him a big head, but he's right. 
Manasquan is a special, special place. The golf course is first class. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You could play that course every day and A, get something different out of it, but B, I think because it's like having two different golf courses. One's very hilly with tree lines and all that stuff, and then the other side is flat with water views. So you, you it's almost like you're playing two golf courses in one day. I, I don't think that you'd get tired of playing that course. The clubhouse, the pro shop, the like the building, the facilities are tremendous. Uh, I was I was blown away. It might be the biggest pro shop I've ever been in. It's got three floors. Uh, the the third floor has this like like practice bay where where Chris can give lessons in. Um, got some storage up there, but it's got two legitimate floors of clothing, gear, shoes, men's, women, hats, balls, anything you, you need. It is enormous. Um, lock room is this, is, you know, a little bit of a throwback, old school kind of looking lock room, which I loved. Um, I like that people put stuff up on their lockers. Um, and there's clearly like a, like different groups of people in these clumpings of, of lockers that have you know, their own little inner club kind of things because there was like trophies around and whatnot. The the bar area, um, which we didn't get to use the other day, but I, I was at when we did the New Jersey Am, is is beautiful. It, it's just, it's top notch as far as those. And then Mike, I think what does it, what truly makes the place special because the golf course speaks for itself. The buildings are are amazing. But I think what makes Manasquan truly special is the people that are there. And I mean that by the membership and the people working there. Uh, I've said it before. Chris has treated me like family from the second we had him on months ago. He's, he's, I don't remember what episode he was, but we had him on. Having met him only a few times, and those were brief interactions, he, he treated me like family immediately. And that tells me something about about him as a person and then when you go there and you see that trickles down from the head pro to the guys working in the shop to the guys working in the bag room to the caddies everybody treats you like you're a member there even though we were guests there and then and then the membership is unbelievably friendly they're saying hi to each other you're talking to you asking how people are doing it, it was just it's a special place, man. It really is. And and Mike's been right about it this whole time. It is a it's it's a special place. It really is. I can't say enough good things about it. I don't know if I have enough words to even describe it cuz it's it was really I was very I was very humbled. I was very f fortunate. I, I, again, I I'm running out of words to to describe. I I can't can't really describe my emotions for that day. It was really a special day for me to be able to, to have people be so generous to have us on at such an amazing place was, was again, was, was just humbling. And, and it was, it was really an amazing day. Again, like, like Mike said, we played with Chris, which was awesome. But then we also played with the club president, Andrew Kelly, and, and Andrew was an amazing host as well. It was, it was just a very, very gracious to have us out. Again, I'm, I'm just going to keep saying the same things over and over again because I, I I don't I don't know how else to say it. It was a it was an incredible incredible day and and a day honestly I don't know if I'll ever forget it. It was it was really really special. Yeah, I mean I I I I knew in my heart of hearts that that's was that was going to be your experience. I I truly did. Um, you know, and I knew that Chris had said, you know, if you think back to when Chris was on, it was like the end of December that we spoke to Chris and it was be, it was one of those things like it'll happen, it'll happen. And like a lot of things in life, it's just finding the right dates that work for everybody. And, you know, we were beyond fortunate that, that Andrew Kelly was able to join us out there. You know, and then also when, you know, you get someone like Andrew out there, you know, he's able to talk about the vision of the golf course and the changes that they made and things that are, you know, they're looking to do there. And, and when you're getting, uh, you know, someone of his stature talking about the, the, you know, progression of the golf course and what his vision is to how to make it even better, um, 
you know, some of those changes that they, he was discussing were just incredible. You know, even something as small as when we were on the 14 T box and he said, just slide over a little bit, go to the new T box that just was formed. Mm -hmm. And now you feel like you're standing on a mountain compared to where you just were, even though it's, you know, five, six feet up, it's not even that high. But when you look at the hole, it completely changes things. Um, right. It brings the so water. Listen, like you I, can I, you see know, more of the water. You can see more of like the, the river or the pond that's in the course, let alone more of the river that's in the that's in the background. It, yeah. Even that small change is something that's. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt that there's there's just so many things that are like um, having him out there with us is just just made it even better. It, it truly did. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, I, I've spoke so highly about that place. You know, but again, you know, the membership is second to none as well. They, they really are. And, and uh, how about this, Mike? I, I just thought of this. We spent four hours, four plus hours with, you know, putting and talking. And, and I've never met Andrew before in my life. Getting to talk to him and, and spending a whole round with him. We talked about so many things, but it, it's not like we ignored each other, right? I don't know what he does. I don't know what his occupation is. And how many times during a golfing round do you just play golf? Be like, oh, what do you do? Like in that kind of situation. So like we talked about so many things that they were they were almost like deeper conversations as opposed to like, oh, Andrew, what do you do? Like it was it it, it he has really his own was... law firm. He has his own law firm. Okay. That that's pretty solid. So, so I, I just it was just kind of yeah. again, I think that was telling to me that like we didn't it was never anything like surface Oh, you know, hi, how are you? What do you do for like, like those like generic, like intro questions that you're kind of like poking and prodding before. I mean, it was, uh, it was again, like we've, like I've known him for years and same thing with Chris. It, it just like, again, I think it's that family environment that trickles down from the top uh, to everybody from, from, you know, all the way down, even to our caddies. I mean, having, having Will and Chase out there with us, they were like they were working hard, but they were laughing. They were joking. Um, it was it was an incredible, incredible experience. All right, Ryan. So we got to toss this to our interview a little bit here, where Chris and I go in depth about what we thought you would experience on the golf course. We predicted what you would shoot before you got on the golf course. So we need to toss this real quick to our conversation with Chris before the round so that people have an idea as to where we thought you would be heading into the day. So let's toss it there. Matera's Italian Market and Catering Company is located in the heart of Rutherford, New Jersey at 72 Park Avenue and has everything you need for an authentic Italian table. Recently celebrating its 10-year anniversary, Matera's Italian Market brings all your senses alive as you walk in the door. Imported retail products, cheeses and cold cuts, freshly baked bread, and the creamiest fresh mozzarella. All can be ordered on the Matera's On Park app in Apple and Google stores. Above the market, a private space called The Loft can be reserved for intimate family parties all the way to corporate events. So give them a follow on Instagram at Matera's Italian Market. Stop by and say ciao. Matars, you'll walk in a stranger, leave his family. But as we get into the golf course today, and I I know this has been a huge topic on the podcast when I bring up Manuscon River is Ryan's, you know, by the way, Mike, I've never played. Did you know that? <laughs> and I have to constantly say, no, I didn't know that. You know, I, I didn't know that you never played here. But the fact Hold that on. He, it's played, but in that, in that, Bob Howes. Yeah. Yeah. I've played yeah. the same yeah. like six holes yeah. in the three times that we've that we've been over here. Yeah. So it's not that I haven't played. He hasn't played 18 holes. One through 18 in order, he has not played. I mean, he's seen it, he's walked it, he's got to experience it, but yeah. actually hitting that little white ball around here. What can you advise him on as to what his expectations are before he hits that first tee shot on the first hole? Because I know what I think is going to happen. <laughs> I do. And he's, he's laughing over there. But from a professional golf perspective, like, what can you advise him 
before we tee this first ball up? Yeah, well, first off, it's going to be great. And we have the president of the club, Andrew Kelly, joining us. And I know he's been looking forward to getting you two guys out here, too. So it's going to be a fun time. We're going to walk with caddies. We're going to do it the right way. Uh, you know, a positive is just like we leading up to the first round of the state amateur, we got a lot of rain last night. So the golf course is certainly going to be on the softer side. It's not going to play firm and fast. So I think that's going to make it a little bit easier for you, Ryan. Okay. Uh, obviously, we're not. So 62 is in play. <laughs> that night. <laughs> so uh, obviously, you're not going to get as much roll in the fairways off the tees, but you're going to be able to hold the greens a little bit easier. You know, listen, I've never played golf with you. Uh, I think, you know, looking at your the social media you guys put out, you, you got a good move at the ball. I think you're going to do just fine. I know Andrew Kelly is going to be my partner. Mike's going to be your partner. I'm not going to give you too much advice because I don't know what we're going to play for, maybe five, ten bucks. But I always like winning five, ten bucks yeah. instead of giving yeah. five, ten bucks. <laughs> so I don't want to give you too much insight. But I still think Manasquan is going to produce a challenge if – if I had to put a guess on your number. Yeah, I want to, this is, I, I am a big prediction guy. I want to know what you think the number is. And I'm going to tell you if I think from my perspective, it's going to be over under. 92. Well, that's a great number. That's a great number. I'm going under though. I'm going under. I, I was going to say. I'm going under as well. I was going to say, if you had asked me, I was going to say 89. 89 was going to be my number, and I think he makes a putt on 18 to break 90, and, he, <laughs> and he's going to have that big ass smile on his face saying, all right, at least I broke 90. <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to be fun. I mean, the golf course is in great shape for August. I think every superintendent in the, in the state right now is kind of in survival mode, you know, with hot weather and stuff like that, and moisture that comes in with hot weather, but the golf course is, is doing great. Matt Morrow and his team are doing such an incredible job, so... I think we're going to get it in a, in a nice way, and I think we're going to have some fun out there. And listen, if it doesn't affect the outcome of the match, I, I'm rooting for you to beat my 92. Like, I appreciate I'm it. rooting for you. <laughs> you know, I want to see something special. Uh, now, we could talk about Mike. You know, Mike has a lot of home field advantage. There's so, no, I, like, there's, I like that I got a caddy on my team. There's not, there's not, I, there's no expectations. Let's just hit the white ball around and let's have some fun. I'm going to say over under for Mike 75. I'll take the over in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Take the over. I take the over. That's a great number. That's too low. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I mean, we're not playing the back tees. We're going to play the blue tees, the member tees. It's yeah. not 6,700 yards. We're not stretching it out. Because I, I was going to say 76, actually. <laughs> so if you wanted a number for I would you. take that right now, get in my car and drive home. 75. I really would. That, to me, that means I played really well. The real yeah. question will be if you have that 10 bucks in your pocket or not. Yeah. yeah, that's all that matters. I don't care if I shoot 95, but if you're opening up that wallet, you know, that, that's all that matters. And <laughs> no question. Mr. Kelly can give Ryan all the money. I'm taking my money from you. That's for certain. <laughs> yeah. And I said I'm a little golfed out, so I don't know what my expectations are. That's, either. that's good. So we'll see. All right. So. Let's hear about the round. Yeah. You know, because I will tell you from my perspective, you know, Andrew and I decided we would take you and Chris on in a little match, you know, and obviously, be, you know, to make a long story short, it was the bigs versus you the little. You two wiped the floor with us. It wasn't close. It was over after 13 and, and money was coming out of our pocket. So I, I think that sums up kind of how the first 13 holes went and we Andrew and I did not play particularly well but I think the story was how well you and Chris did play through you specifically through 15 holes you know I thought you you played unbelievably well through 15 holes and I think getting on that 18th tee was something you know that we'll get to but I do want to throw this out there through nine holes, Ryan starts the round off. Let, let's just, I guess, let's just even rewind this. Let's rewind to the start. Let's, yeah. Let, let's rewind to the start because very first hole, short dog leg right, left, par four. Um, you know, two tier green, tough little shot. Ryan hits his first, his tee shot in the right rough. You know, nothing crazy, nothing terrible. No warm and then up. Decides you know, I, didn't, I didn't hit any balls yeah, before, no, yeah. so just kind of slapped no. a five iron out there. Yeah. Then throws a dart, damn near goes in the freaking hole on the first hole, 
to about three feet. And so I'm let saying me tell to myself, you, okay, I hit this- that. I hit that, and I've never met again. Chase was Chase was my caddy. I, I hit that, and as soon as I struck it, I don't even know if I finished my follow through. I said that might go in. <laughs> Oh, God, here we go. So thankfully, I didn't hear that part of it. But <laughs> he throws this dart at the pin. Lands maybe three feet just past the pin. Now, it ends three feet. You it know, landed like a foot to the left of the pin. You know, pin it landed high. damn near yeah. went in the hole. But it, it finished, I should say, it finished about three feet past the pin. Yeah. And at this point, I'm saying, like, all right, this is not an easy putt. It's downhill. It's a little bit of a slider, like left to right. You got to make sure, you, you know, you get it on the line. And I know that this easily could be a three putt. And I have a gut feeling like this is how the day could go. Lo and behold, as the saying goes, you can't birdie them all if you don't birdie the first. He knocks in the birdie putt on the first hole. Andrew and I look at each other and, and know right from the get-go this is going to be a long freaking day. <laughs> but we get to the second hole. Okay, we get to the second hole. The hardest hole on the golf course as per, you know, the, the the ratings, I guess, of every hole. What's that? Yeah. The handicap. The, I handicap. Say, the handicap yep. of every hole. First handicap, hardest hole. He butchers the hole. He makes an eight. Absolutely a, makes an eight. It's a par four, for those that don't know. <laughs> yeah, par four. Makes an eight. And I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, that's it. The post birdie, you know, fuck up. Here we go. It's going straight downhill after this. He's, he's done. All right, he's done. Hold on. We get can, to the third hold hole. On, hold on. Can we go back? Mike says butchered it. And, like, I didn't hit a ball out of bounds on, on eight. Uh, it wasn't like I lost a ball. I didn't put one in a water or anything like that. I, my tee no, shot went just about took eight 20 shots. yards in front of me. Then I, then I got it out into the fairway. Then I missed the green. Then I got a – like, I – Try to punch it out. I'm kind of against, like, uh, I'm on the right-hand side. I was hoping I was in the bunker because I would have rather be than, there than where I was. Then I have to try to, like, muscle one out of some tough grass and, and, like, right up against some bushes. Short of the green, chip on, it rolls past, three putt. I mean, it was, it was, it wasn't like it was, like, one in the water and then another. No, no, this was, this was, honestly, the only good shot was, the second one off the drive. I hit that solidly and just got it out into the fairway. So it was seven really poor shots. Yeah, so you made an eight on the second hole. So that's what everybody says. That's why you don't birdie the first hole. You know, so Ryan starts off three, eight. Now, I promise to the audience, don't fast forward. I'm not going to go hole by hole, but I think the start of this is very important so you understand, like, where we're at. So we birdie the first hole. We make a quad on the second hole. We go to the next hole, par three, you know, all right, not not a super hard hole. Kind of what you see is what you get. Knocks on the green, two par putts, three, makes deep par. into the wind. I mean, we should mention there dead was a ton the wind. of wind. Dead into the yeah. wind. Dead in. It was two so club wind all day. It, knocks it onto the green, two putts, makes par. So the dude starts off three, eight, three after the first three holes. Now, I don't know if you would have said before the round you're going to start off being only three over through three holes. But you might have signed up for that. It's bogey golf, right? Yeah. It's bogey golf. And I know, like, all right, we can keep it somewhere in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. I don't think you would have thought bogey golf would have went birdie, quad, par. <laughs> but I think that kind of outlines how the front nine went. Because if you take away that second hole where you make an eight, you shoot 42 on the front nine. Right, so even if I had that's doubled, golfing. even if I had doubled the second hole, I shoot forty on the front. Right. If I had so just... when I go back when I go back to the Instagram post of those people posting sub eighty and me initially thinking it's Ryan Kulop bots out there, maybe I was like, damn, this dude's on track. He's on track. He shot forty two, puts together a little bit of a back nine. So you shoot 42, the sub-90 guys are loving life. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a damn near lock that you're going sub-90. So you shoot 42 on the front nine. Yep. Give me your take about what you thought the front nine was like and kind of what you thought maybe of the front nine. So I, I loved it. I really did. It was... Like, when we talk about it being tree-lined and, and being mountainous... 
like quote unquote mountainous. Like it's is a very, very hilly front there. It's not. It's not like it's. It's just like there's some trees. It's not like you can't see the other holes. Like it's not like, um, like a matita cock where like you're walking down a hole and you know the hole is next to you. The next hole is next to you, but you can't see it because there's that many trees in between the two. So I think that helped a little bit. Like my shot on seven um, to to kind of get away. I kind of pulled the drive a little bit, but like had a clean look. No trees, you know, there's a, a tree in front of me, but I can, I can go right of it. Um, and it was, it was close enough where like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit, you know, not worried about hitting it. Um, end up getting caught in the rough anyway, but, but regardless, like it wasn't, it was, it wasn't like, it wasn't super wooded, I guess is my point. Beautiful undulations in the fairways, um, if you look at like the back, the back is rather flat. You know, there's no real like you're in the fairway. You're never like on a down slope or on an up slope or like um, like the ball's not usually above your feet or below your feet. But the entire front nine, you, you pretty much are. Um, and it, it was it was beautiful aesthetically. We've talked about that. Like I like the different views of like seeing the mountains and the and trees and like hills, undulations, all that kind of stuff. I, I, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love the, even things like I love where the, where the halfway house is. You can get it at a bunch of different times, you know? And I think that that's, um, I think that's an awesome spot for that, for that halfway house. And again, brand new halfway house. Love the, you know, I'm an amenities guy. Love the, the water coolers that are, that are there. They have like these, um, like water fountains, but, um, but, but that's not doing justice to what it actually is. It, it was, it was just, it was beautiful. It really was. I, I loved every bit of the front, which, you know, again, if you're, if you've been paying attention, you know, that's the side I have never played. Um, it was, it was beautiful. It really was. I don't know how else to, so how else to say it. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, listen, no doubt. So you play extremely well on the front. Yep. Okay. And, and Andrew and I are getting absolutely waxed. It's not even close. I'm horrific. He's, he's be thankfully, he's better than me. And, you know, we get to the back nine. And 10 is dead into the wind. If anybody doesn't know the 10th hole, it's straight uphill. It's about 440 yards, maybe, you know, in that ballpark. But when you're into the wind, obviously, it plays a little longer. Um, and even Chris made a point that, like, when 10 is dead into the wind, that means 11's down win. So he kind of mentally switches the pars on those holes, thinking 10's a par 5 and 11's a par 4, even though really the pars are different. But you get to 10, and you kind of slap it around a little bit, but you make a bogey. Right? I made you a make par. a bogey. I uh, hit that putt. Oh, you made the putt. I made that right? putt. I yep. take that back. You're right. Take that back. Right. You made. You got up and down for par and ten. Yeah. You got up and down for right, par and I ten. Hit, right. Because I, I hit I a think... drive because it was yes. and it was super. It, you know, it wasn't very long. Then I had. Right. You know, I was kind of in the rough, so I, I got it up greenside. You know, punched, you know, yes. chipped it on. I had. You like made. A, you made, made a good like, a 15, like ten footer. Yeah, I thought it was like 12, 15 feet, but yeah, made a big. Yeah. Cut. Okay. So you made. I take that back. I stand corrected. You made a good par and ten, and I think this is when I kind of threw the towel in. So we get to the 11 tee box, you know, and it's a par five, downhill, downwind, easily gettable, out of bounds all along the right-hand side. And everybody knows if you hit it right, it's gone. Just might as well re-tee. And we watch you tee off. And you hit this ball so far right that we are like, all right, he's out of the hole. Like, it's up to Chris now. Like, here's our chance. Here's our opening. We're going to make this happen. And some miraculous person up in the sky sees this ball fading, slicing, cutting, whatever definition of the word you want to use, going right. I like power Somehow, cutting. Somehow, <laughs> some way, the caddies give the safe sign. And I'm looking at Andrew saying, how the hell is that safe? Well, lo and behold, we walk down there and there the ball is. Fairway hit. Ryan's ball is on the right side of the fairway. Any other human being, that ball's <laughs> in a member's backyard. Yeah, I, I got Ryan's I ball's got in the middle of the fairway. One. And I think that kind of 
summarizes the first 15 holes as to how your day was going. Because I thought those first 15 holes, and I think to Andrew and Chris's, you know, you know, they agreed is you hit the ball so well, so well. But I think, and I know this has come up on a lot of things that I've said, those last four holes at Manasquan River make or break your round. There's no doubt about it. You could be playing really well going into 15 and somehow some way the round just crumbles. But to your, to your credit, you got through 15. You got through 15. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like you, you look at the back. I, I made the par on 10. I ended up bogey in 11 because I had a bad three putt. Um, I bogeyed 12, and it was downwind. I, I, I kind of flubbed a chip into a bunker and then was on and two putt. Um, I, I made a bad decision. If I redo it, I think it's... 14 that I hit iron and should have hit driver. Is that the one where, yeah, I'd go back and I'd hit driver again because I ended up being in a bunker and then had to, you know, a fairway bunker. Um, so ended up making bogey there. I had no blow ups as of yet through 15. I had a couple bogeys sprinkled in a, you know, par on 10. I think I parred. Um, no, I went bogey, bogey. I went par, bogey, 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 bogey. Um, and then 15, I bogeyed as well. I don't know if that, if that gets us there, but I, you know, no real blow ups, just bogey golf, really. Then 16, I pull my drive left, but I'm safe. And I'm kind of in that in between 16 and 17. And, and this is like a, a nice aesthetic, Mike, to, to the course. I love when they kind of have shared fairways or shared parts. And that's a really cool spot where like they, it's kind of of a shared area there, especially where I hit it. You know, like you're teeing off over where I was. You know, you hit a bad tee if you were on 17, if you were where I was on 16. But it's kind of a shared area there. But I'm not in any kind of any kind of garbage. I'm just in the rough. And then I have to hit out of the rough. And I got like, it's into the wind. Wind's a little into and across. Uh... The balls, you know, I got a decent lie. So rather than just chip out short of the water, I go for it. And I hit an amazing shot. I got this ball as flush as possible. And it should have, like with the wind, I'm thinking it's going to draw it back in and knock it down. But I hit it as clean as possible. Well, ball gets lost. So we, we assume that goes in the hazard over the green. Yes. Because you nutted it. And we assume that it hit the down slope and just shot to the hazard over the green. And then we can't find it. So got a drop, chip on, you know, take, take a double on 16. Now, again, I don't like to credit Mike, but Mike is right. The walk from 16 to 17 is stunning. You're out into the river as far as possible. Um, uh, again, like the wispy fescue, it's got those, uh, are they called tiger tails? Those like high reeds there. That just, it's just, it's beautiful. I get to 17. Here's the thing about 17, Mike. You look like you could land an airplane on that fairway because of its sharedness between 16. It's a pretty big open area, right? Like, I think you'd agree. Well, 100%, 100%. <laughs> I pull mine left. So on 16, I pull it left near 17. 17, I pull it left near 16. But I get lucky again. I'm short of a waste bunker in the middle there. I'm on the fairway. I'm in the, I'm in the go zone. I, got, I think it's like 207, I think I had to the, to the pin. So I, you know, it's, it's and and to your credit, you're about a yard short of that waste bunker. Yeah, where my ball is in the waste bunker, which makes it a lot harder for second shot. You you position that thing perfectly. Per, yeah, because uh, I'm highly skilled golfer. So I right. So uh, I I don't know if it's I I definitely said it to Mike. I wasn't as focused as I needed to be, because I had a club that I felt good about. 
and I just like I went up there and just slapped at it. It was not a good swing. It ends up going well long and ends up in the front yard of the house next to the hole, which is out of bounds. So I got a drop, I chip on, and I end up taking, you know, a double again. Uh, funny that Mike and I were about 10 yards away on our second shot and that I didn't see Mike again until we stood on the tee on 18. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so now, so now we've doubled 16, doubled 17. Now we move on to 18. Well, I hear these two little school girls start cackling as they start talking about things and I go, whoa, 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 I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to know what my number is because I know, and you'll hear it in the interview, Chris said I was going to shoot 92 and Mike said I was going to shoot 89. So I don't know where I sit because I don't, I don't like to know those kind of things. Uh, I just want to play golf. I don't want to deal with like, with that kind of, with that kind of stuff. I don't want to I don't want to know, you know, I, I'm, I'm good on knowing, but they start like chirping. So I have an idea of where I am. I, I, I know that I can, to be honest, I think that I was, I think my score was higher. I think I thought my score was higher on the T of 18 than it was. So I thought that I needed to like hole out from the fairway. In order to to get Mike his 89. But my goal, honestly, my goal in in playing that day, I should say this. Chris said 92. Mike said 89. My goal was to break 90. That was my, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of a a fine round for me. Um, That, that's kind of where I sit, especially playing from where we were playing and, and, you know, not knowing the course. I would have loved to break 90. That was my goal going into the day. So they start kind of cackling over on the, on the T box there on 18 and I don't want to know, I don't want to know where I sit. And so I tee it up, hit my driver, tug it left. I wouldn't even say I tugged it hard left. I tug it left though. And it's flirting with the bushes, flirting with the bushes. And if you don't know Manasquan, there's bushes that line the road on the left hand side and they're out of bounds. So we, we kind of lose it as it lands. So I end up hitting a provisional, pipe the provisional right down the fairway. But I hope that I can find it. Hopefully it got another miraculous kick out of the, you know, either, either kicked off the cart path and went straight or kicked, uh, you know, hit off the bushes and just kicked out. You know, just, just want to find the ball in play. Well, we don't find it. Looking, 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 no real, no real luck. And, and, you know, Chris hits it further than me. So I'm not going to look 40 yards past where his drive went. Cause that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I have to play the provisional. So I'm in the fairway in three. I hit a pretty good chip. What I thought was a pretty good chip, but it catches, it has a little bit of spin, catches a slope and runs back off the green next to the green side, the front green side bunker. So now I'm there in four. I'm a little too far to put it. So I do a little bump and run with my seven iron. It's, it's going to run hard right to left. So I put it along like a, the, the fringe of the green. It's got to go up over a hump. So I hit a, a, a really good shot up there. You couldn't hit that shot any better if I gave you 100 balls. <laughs> and I say that because I've seen that shot so many times. I've seen it left below the mound. I've seen it sculled over the green. I've seen someone chunk. I've seen, you've seen them all. Yeah. And the fact that you hit that shot to have it ride the back of the right-hand side, it climbs the slope, it trickles down back off the slope, I'm like, the three of us look at each other like, you could not have hit that any better. And, I don't care who you are. And what's funny is I, I thought I hit it too far. I thought I was going to be off the green in the back. Not really seeing from where I was that there's kind of like a backstop there. And when it did come back, it trickled to, what, three, four feet? Yeah, I was going to say four feet. 
And so now I got this putt for six, you know, to double bogey the hole and end double, double, double. I put a good putt on it. I, I really did. I, I hit a, and I hit before, a good... and before you say anything about the putt, okay. before you say anything, about the putt. So but it's like one, I will say this. It's, it's almost the exact same putt as one. Yep. hundred percent. And so now this is when it gets interesting because Ryan references the cackling on the green from Chris and I. Okay. And I know that Ryan has a total of 83 strokes going into the last hole. And I see that obviously he ducks the drive or pulls it and it ends up out of bounds. So I know he needs a double bogey to shoot my score of 89. And he's got this three footer above the hole slider mimicking the first hole. He makes it. I am spot on on 89. All the people that voted that said sub 90 win. I, I'm dying. I can't wait. And then he puts a three footer. And I don't know any of this because I don't want to know. Because right. so, I just want to hit the putt. I don't want any extra nerves or anything like that. And I putt this ball exactly on the line. I, I will say this, Mike. I think I putted really well. I think I, 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 I really did. I, I really think that I had a good day on the greens. Put it exactly where I wanted to. Chase again, telling me, "Hey, we're going to kind of drop it in there, let it, let the slide, slide it, and just put it right here." I put it right there, and it just rolls over the lip enough to change the path of it. Like it kind of hooks it around. It goes, it's from left to right, and it goes across the front of the hole, catches the right side of the hole. And goes around the back of the cup out the left hand side. That's how much I missed it by. By a quarter of a ball. And tap in for, for my 90. So for those that for those that said sub ninety. You have to you have a big apology. You have a big apology because sub ninety, that was where the bulk of the votes were. Sub ninety was the bulk of the votes. So the people that went sub one hundred, they won. And the people that said they didn't want to talk about it, I was dying at that response because there were quite a few people that said he didn't, he wouldn't want to talk about his round. <laughs> but I was going to force him whether it was good or bad. <laughs> so that was the losing answer. But the winning answer was sub 100. So I, I want to apologize to the people that said sub 90. I legitimately felt bad like I let you down because I could not have played those last three holes any worse than I did. And I think it was that shot on 16 that kind of took the wind out of my sails. Like, just kind of, I, I couldn't, not that I couldn't forget it. I wasn't thinking about it. But, you know, you look for a ball long enough and then you kind of, you chip one on. You, you just, you kind of finish the hole and you're just like, eh, okay, well, that sucked. I kind of, I, I, I felt, I said it to Mike. I said, I've let people down and, and I'm very sorry for that. So I am. Now I'll say this, because of my handicap, I cannot take an eight on a hole. So I posted an 89. I think that's conversations for another day um, <laughs> as to the handicap thing. But <laughs> listen, I think at the end of the day, you played really good. But those last three holes kind of bitch in the butt. A couple, couple bad a, breaks here and a, there. A but couple I bad think... breaks, but you were right about the end of that. Like that, that course, it's 15 through 18 can make or break around. And as you said, I was 83 standing on 18. And at that point I had gone double, double. So even if you go bogey, bogey, I'm 81 standing on 18's green with a chance to, again, bogey and 81 to five is 86. I'd sign up for an 86 there any day. So like you take away some of those things and it's like, it was. It, it's the it's those last couple holes that make or break it, and they instead of making it, they broke it for me. Yeah, no doubt. But like anything, I think I think you know your overall day was a positive. It was. Oh my it's God. finally nice. It's finally nice to get you out there to end this summer. You know, so as as summer concludes and we head off into you know September here, it's nice to get you. Away from the comment of Mike, I've never played there before. Um, I'm sure the audience will love the idea that, you know, hopefully we can, 
you know, put Manasquan River and the talk of Manasquan River on the back burner a little bit, knowing how much you've said it, how much I've spoken about it. But I think that just also speaks to the to the place itself. Um, it's hard not to talk about a spot that is so damn good. Um, so again, listen, from my end, obviously, thanks to Chris, thanks to to Andrew, and thanks to everybody there for, for allowing us to come in there and letting us have some fun while we played some golf. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Mike, I think you're right in that we're no longer going to talk about, hey, Mike, you know I've never played that course, right? But, but now we alter to, hey, Mike, I want my revenge on that course. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take on those last couple holes again. And hole two, let me tell you hole two, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for hole two. All right. So, hey, listen. Uh, it, it, it really was. And, and I'll, you know, Mike, I, I know we joke quite a bit. I really um, thank you for, for making that happen um, and, and kind of having that connection and, and being right about it. You know, it was, it really is a special place. So thank you for, you know, for making that happen. Chris, again, I've said it a ton. Thank you for having me out there. Thank you for, for again, treating me like part of the family. And I, I, I really, uh, again, I, I feel very fortunate, very humbled by, by that. And Andrew, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us, being with us, having me out there, having us out there. It, it was, again, I, I can't say it enough, very, a very special place in, in the golf world. It really is. From stem to stern. It's, it's amazing. So thank you, guys. All right, so that wraps up our recap of our day at Manasquan River. Now we're going to send it to our, the rest of our interview that we did prior to our round uh, with Chris Dimmick, head professional at Manasquan River. Enjoy. All County Exteriors is a third-generation, premier exterior home remodeling company celebrating over 40 years in business. In a remodeling world where the average remodeling company only survives in business for only five years, All County Exteriors has stood the test of time, providing their customers with top quality roofing, siding, windows, and doors. They service homeowners and builders with anything from small repairs to large additions. All County Exteriors is not just limited to construction. They have a deep passion for giving back to their community and are charitable supporters for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the American Caring Society, Roofs for Troops, and Parents of Autistic Children. If you have planned to do any exterior remodeling, call the experts at All County Exteriors for a free, no obligation estimate for your project. Just call 732-370-2780 or email them at info at allcountyonline.com. That's 732-370-2780 for all county exteriors, for all your remodeling needs. Okay, so today's guest, you know, we're fortunate enough to be in-house here at Manasquan River. The head golf professional, Chris Dimmick, is our guest today. Chris, thanks so much for having us here. Yeah, Mike, Ryan, thanks for being here. Looking forward to a great day. Dude, I'm so excited. Yeah, I, really listen, I, I think this is something that <laughs> Ryan has been itching to play, to see, to experience. And I think what is ideal is that we're here sitting down with you talking about it. Um, and then he gets to go, you know, I think gets swallowed by the golf course at the end of the day. <laughs> um, but before we even dive into that aspect, let's talk a little bit about the state am and, and that week that was here. Because, you know, I know I reached out to a lot of the, the players afterwards to get their opinions of this place. and. I don't know if I had one comment from anybody, you know, up and down the state that had something negative to say. Um, talk a little bit about that week itself. Yeah, so I'll speak on behalf of the club. It, it was a very special week to have the state amateur here for the third time in the history, actually the fourth time in the history of the club. And the two times prior, Mr. Bob Housen was victorious here at Manusquan River Golf Club. You know, so there was a lot of history leading up to the event, you know, Fourth time having it, we haven't had it for a very long time. We had the state open in 2012, and we had great club representation back then, but you know, the excitement building into this event, you know, we did a renovation about five years ago, so the golf course was ready to shine, and it certainly did. 
uh, you know, the build up to it, we were focused on getting the golf course firm and fast. Matt Morrow, our superintendent and his staff, just did an absolutely incredible job preparing the golf course for the championship. Now, Sunday came and we got a lot of rain. And um, there was definitely some worrisome that the golf course was gonna play soft, that it was gonna get chewed up. We had a small little greens committee meeting the Thursday prior. Uh, Matt talked about doing some light watering leading up to the event. We obviously knew the forecast for Sunday. I was at the greens committee meeting saying, I'm afraid that 62 might get dropped on this place. And uh, because of that forecast, we were afraid it was gonna get soft. We knew how talented the field was, but obviously the true winner was the golf course, in my opinion. It performed to the highest degree. By the time Wednesday showed up, uh, the golf course was shown its true colors. Obviously, we could get in more detail about who won and what transpired then. But in my opinion, the golf course shined through and through. Um, the experience that each one of the participants had from the second day arrived to the second day left, I feel Manasquan River Golf Club showcased as a club, but then obviously the golf course to the highest degree showcased. Is, is, you said you, you thought that someone would shoot 62 with all that rain. Is that something that you guys go into an event like that being like, this is the numbers we're looking for. Like we have a talented field. We want to try to keep them at 68, 67, 69, somewhere in there. Or is it, is it like, like what's that thought process? Yeah, obviously the talent level is very high and you want to see great golf. So whatever gets shot, gets shot. And if 62 gets dropped and, and you know, 63 is the course record here at the club. And that was shot by Chris Goderup who's obviously doing great things out on the Corn Ferry Tour and hopefully will be on the PGA Tour in the near future. But um, 63 is the current course record. Uh, there was definitely some fear of that. That's good uh, to know for me today. Yeah, no question, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> on the front for nine. For us to say, we're not, we're, he's, he's talking 18 holes course record. Right. <laughs> on the front nine for you, Ryan. But <laughs> in my opinion, you know, you, I think Matt Morrow, our superintendent, was probably he doesn't want to see the golf course get chewed up. You know, I think the, the green staff at any club takes great pride in their conditions. Obviously, everybody wants to have firm and fast conditions. And if firm and fast conditions are present, usually nobody's going to chew it up. Now, with the weather that was forecasted, there was definitely some fear that it was going to be out of Matt's control. Um, Thankfully, we only got a half inch of rain Sunday night into Monday, where North Jersey got about an inch and a half, two inches. We missed that a little bit. So that presented the golf course still a little firm. Uh, it was soft Monday morning, and we saw some good scores get shot Monday morning into Monday afternoon. Tuesday, it kind of leveled out a little bit, but then come Wednesday, it certainly was shown its true colors and its true teeth. Yeah, I listen, I, and I think that was when we spoke about this at length before the tournament started. I ultimately thought like the golf course was going to be the winner because I, I just knew that it's not a, you know, grip and rip, just take your driver out and bomb it. There is some strategy that needs to be involved. You have to kind of think your way around it, you know, poke and prod a little bit. And I think after speaking to so many of the, you know, the college kids and the younger guys, I think that's what a lot of them said is like, having that course knowledge about this place carried so much weight. And I think that truly shined in the final results. I mean, not for nothing, but like, I know Jack and, and Jerry basically live on the golf course. They are here, they grew up, this is their place. But I think that also helped other guys. Like when you saw Mike Stamberger going so low in that first round, and then you see all the other names of guys that are here or even just have played here numerous times, like that carried a huge advantage for them. Yeah, it sure did. And, you know, obviously, without being said, you got to give kudos to Jack Simon. I mean, he played unbelievable golf, uh, you know, what he did leading up to that final round. And, you know, he held it together pretty good in the final round. He obviously took some lumps throughout the round, but was right there all the way till the end. Uh, made, obviously, an incredible birdie on the 17th hole. I got to be out there to witness it. And then truly had a, had a great opportunity on the 18th hole in regulation, the 72nd hole of the tournament to, to end it right then and there. Uh, the putt just missed. And then, you know, what happened in the playoff was a little bit unfortunate. But, you know, a kudos to him for obviously great play. But, you know, when I think about the week at Manasquan River, you think about, you know, from a, a club perspective, 
you, you got to talk about a couple of things that really were special. You know, one, the show, the course shine. Two, the winner of the event came from our home club. Three, Mike Stamberger shooting 30 on the back nine in regulation is just absolutely incredible. And to, to have a club member do that, it, you know, I don't know if there's historical data that would produce that that's the competitive course record on the back nine, but I, I would guarantee it probably is which was really special. You know, Richie Fitzsimmons, who's another member, making a hole in one in the final round. Uh, Chris Hausen, you know, unfortunately he missed the cut by one, but making two eagles on his back nine in his second round, including a hole out, you know, from about 170 yards was obviously really special too. So as a whole, you know, the club was uh, very proud of the week. You know, Jeremy Wall finishing third. He was really the only player in the field that had three rounds under par. Uh, you know, shooting 71 those final three rounds. So it, it was really special. Uh, we'll talk more, I'm sure, soon about Jack Wall. But, you know, the golf course, uh, we as a club, and, you know, I know Matt Morrow, our superintendent, and his staff is uh, very proud of what they accomplished that week. So let's get into Jack yeah. winning. I, I think that, you know, I think going into it, if there was betting odds, Jack would have had to have been the odds on favor to win the whole thing. But I also think with that comes a lot of pressure, you know, because not only are you probably the odds on favor, and maybe I don't even want to say the best player, but for where were the course is and where the tournament is, like you are the best player. I think seeing him win and how he went about doing it, it was nothing special in terms of he went out and shot 65. He just managed his golf ball so well. And then I think to see like the crowd there at the end of the round when he drives the 18th green in the playoff and then all the people around and then seeing his raw emotion afterwards when he's talking, like what was that like having a homegrown on course? I mean, you gave lessons to those guys all growing up. So for you, it had to even hit home a lot different than someone like me who's watching from the outside. Yeah, I, I mean, it was emotional. There's no question. It, it was a it was a special week, and obviously the icing on the cake, you know, happened when Jack was victorious. But you know, to talk a little bit about it, you know, like I said, the two times we had the state amateur prior, you know, Bob Housen was able to host that trophy. I believe it was 1980 and 1993. You know, he was able to hoist the trophy here at Manusquan River. Obviously, that was well before my time, but I'm sure the club was very proud of him back then. Uh, just like they were of Jack. But, you know, to talk about those expectations, you know, um, I am nowhere near the level player that Jack Wall is. But, you know, we had the 2022 New Jersey PGA Section Championship here, uh, here last year. And, and leading up to that event, you know, I definitely was playing some pretty good golf. And there was some expectations internal and there was some expectations from the membership. And, that obviously completely backfired for me. You know, I went out and I shot one under on the opening nine holes. And I was, I, I think that was the worst thing that I possibly could have done because that just continued to build, build, build. And then, you know, my remaining 27 holes were pretty poor before I missed the cut. Uh, that being said, those same kind of expectations were on Jack, you know, internal, whether he says it or not, he definitely had some internal expectations and had this circled for a while, wanting to win on his home club. And then, you know, leading up to the event, the two, three weeks prior to that, the membership certainly had conversations with Jack around the range and the scoreboard. Hey, you know, what are you going to shoot? What are you going to win by? What are you going to do? And all that kind of stuff. And like you just said, Mike, you know, that, that goes both ways. You have the home, home course advantage, but you definitely have those expectations that are very hard to accomplish. And, and Jack handled it so well. I don't think he played his best golf throughout the week. He played very steady golf. He hit the ball tremendous. I was not here on Monday, but he hit the ball tremendous when I watched him on Tuesday and Wednesday. His putting was not his best, and I think if he putted better, he possibly would have lapped the field. Uh, but that being said, you know, the way he you know, took charge of the final round in the middle of the round, leaked a little oil on 15-16, which we could talk about how everybody did because the wind picked up, the golf course was very firm and fast at that time. Uh, but then how the way he regrouped in regulation, made a very solid par on 17, made a great birdie in regulation on 18 uh, to post three under. Obviously, Jack Simon 
uh, made that birdie on 17 and then part 18 to get to that number my number of minus three but the members were out and they were in full throttle and they were definitely watching him on that back nine and he performed nicely they watched him come to 18 make that birdie in regulation and I, I would have to say that out of the 250 members that were here watching, you know, all 250 of them probably thought it was over right then and there. Uh, Jack Simon did what he did on 17 and then made the nice par on 18. So it went to the playoff and, and you know, it was about 250 against one. And, you know, and you feel for Jack Simon in that moment because he's, he's the guy from the outside and everybody's here rooting for the home dog and Jack Wall. and. You know, Jack Simon performed beautifully all week. And obviously in the playoff, you know, Jack Wall was able to come out on top. And when he hit that drive on the 18th hole, you know, how it rolled up onto the green and how it caught the ridge of the green and rolled back towards the pin. From my angle, I mean, I actually thought there was a chance it was going to go in for a hole in one. And then as Jack was walking up to the green, like he said to you guys a few weeks ago on the podcast, you know, he did not know until he was about... 40 yards short of the green that, you know, somebody then told him, hey, you're about eight feet away. And the shock on his face probably equaled the shock on everybody else's face that witnessed something that special. Uh, and it was obviously great to see for the club, great to see for Jack. His emotions uh, when he was presented the trophy, how he spoke about what it meant to him to you know, put his name on a trophy that has so many great special names on it. But then also, you know, he thought about Bob Housen, who did it here in 1980 and 1993. And to say that he put his name on the trophy here at Manasquan River, just like Bob Housen, who arguably is, if not one of the greatest amateur players in the history of New Jersey, uh, it definitely got Jack emotional. The State Golf Association was kind enough to allow me to present the trophy to him. I got emotional because as you said, Mike, you know, when I first started here in 2008 as a young assistant, he was, he was seven years old. And I've watched a kid grow up in, my, in front of my eyes, not only as a golfer, but as a person. And he's become a great young man uh, that I think the sky is the limit and we're gonna see how it goes. But I think this championship will catapult him to better things. I got, I got goosebumps thinking about you presenting the trophy to him and like having this movie reel in your mind of like the first time you met him hitting balls on the range working with him just like this uh, again like it's a, mo a movie reel is the only way to describe it as you're handing him the trophy just kind of like sprinting to now uh, again I, that gives me chills thinking about it. i can't imagine what you must have felt yeah i i mean i i remember coming here at the age of 21 as a young assistant and like i said he was seven years old and you know, there was, there was members that would sit outside by the scoreboard, which is just on the other side of the driving range. And they would watch him on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, you know, hit little wedge shots. And, and his nickname here at the club was Silky uh, because his, his swing was so silky smooth at a young age. And, you know, now it's, in my opinion, violent, but in a good way, you know, he generates so much club speed. Um, he makes other aspects of the game look silky, but when he gets the driver in his hand, it's obviously the furthest thing from Silky because, you know, the swing speed's 128 miles per hour and he's carrying it 330 yards in the air and it's, it's so impressive. But yeah, to see it come full circle, um, and I've, I've definitely spent some time with Jack on his game over the years. He doesn't need much and I know he has a great swing coach up at Manhattan Woods. But, you know, we've talked about the mental side of the game. We've talked about some short game aspects of the game. And, you know, it's nice to see those things continue to grow. And like I said, you know, I'm excited of where the future is going to go. Uh, I know he has one more year at Texas Tech, and it's a big year for him with the PGA Tour U rankings. And obviously, if he could go down there and, you know, catapult this state amateur victory to great success on the college level this year, you know, who knows, this time next year, we might be seeing him on the Corn Ferry or the PGA Tour doing some great things. So you had mentioned like talking about him mentally, and I think that's the thing that I was most impressed with in his victory. Obviously, he's a great golfer, but but when, like so is Jack Simon. You know, he, he played great golf as well. But I think what makes Jack Wall that is special is that he was able to take that pressure that you mentioned before. Like you had similar pressure, diff a little different situation, but the hometown pressure, and he's able to like either harness it and get rid of it or like whatever the case is, but he's able to not let that bother him seemingly. And 
and then not only in this kind of environment, but he just seems like he has that, you want to call it like an it factor. Like he just seems like he has it to, to not let some of those things distract him, whereas other people, you, you can see, get distracted by things. Yeah, I think he knows what his potential is. And, and I think he, he knows how good he could possibly be. I, I think having the opportunity to play his first three years of college golf at South Carolina, and he had a really special player on the team in the name of Ryan Hall. And Ryan Hall's out on the Corn Ferry Tour right now, and he, he's just clawing and he's trying to make it. And I think we're going to hear good things out of Ryan Hall in the future. But then, you know, to think about it, that he got to play with Ludwig Aberg, you know, this last year at Texas Tech. I mean, Ludwig obviously was the number one ranked amateur in the world, the best college player, Haskins Award winner. He's gone on out onto the PGA Tour right now because he won the PGA Tour U rankings. And he's done an incredible job. And it, it actually wouldn't surprise me if um, the European captain, Luke Donald, makes a pick of Ludwig Aberg here to be on the Ryder Cup team. But I think that has helped Jack. You know, it's got him in a mindset that I could be just like the two of them. And when it comes to whether it's a local event like the state amateur here or whether it's the Western amateur, or whether it's the Southern amateur, that he gets to play all these great events, I think he goes in not cocky, but confident. And I think he believes in his ability. Do, do I think he still has some you know, room to grow and improve? I think he would answer that, that he does as well. But the confidence is there. I know he knows he's capable of hitting every single shot. And like I said, the, the future is to be told, but I, I think it has potential to be very bright. Yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned that because Chris mentioned the same thing, uh, Goddard, when we had him on, talking about using some of the, the other people who have come before him and talking about talking to them about what to expect, how to prepare, how to, you know, do, how to live basically and how to be a professional golfer. And Jack seems to have the same or, or similar resources at his disposal, which is be hugely beneficial. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, obviously Christopher got her up, went to Rutgers and then went to Oklahoma and Jack Wall never played with him collegiately. You know, but he definitely played with him at the high school level, mm -hmm. and they've remained great friends. When Chris Goddard up shot the course record here a few years ago, Jack was his host that day, and you know, so I know Jack Wall communicates with Christopher Goddard up on a regular basis. And you know, to think about that, Ryan Hall at South Carolina, you know, Ludwig Aberg at Texas Tech, and Christopher Goddard up as a great friend of Jack's, you know, definitely using those resources, asking them questions asking where their mind is in certain events and stuff like that. I, I think that's only beneficial to a guy like Jack Wall, for sure. It's a nice, it's a nice little foursome. It really it's is. It's a nice little foursome. Pretty good one. <laughs> yeah. But let's get into you a little bit here, because I know that you mentioned at the top here, you weren't here on Monday, okay, in terms of when the state am started. And I know that your game has been, you know, progressing in a nice way. And, and I know for, you know, a lot of guys, you know, getting in the state open is is an accomplishment but then making the cut is another thing and i think you know why don't we talk a little bit about where you're at and kind of like where you were when this state am started how well you were playing at that event to kind of like the state o the state uh, excuse me the state open and then the section championship that out at mountain ridge yeah so it, it's been an exciting year uh, like i said i was playing good last year and then you know the section championship here at manasquan river came and you know, for me, it was a complete dud. I mean, the, obviously the golf course performed great, you know, very nicely. Nick Bova winning was great. And, and, you know, it was a great event. But for me personally, I had some high expectations that week. I wouldn't say I was planning on winning the event, but I definitely thought it was probably to this point, my best chance to possibly qualify for the National Club Pro, which I think in our section, you have to finish in the top 12. I definitely felt strongly about that. It obviously didn't happen. I missed the cut. And right there, it lit a fire in me. And, you know, I, I've spent some time, you know, this the off season taking some lessons from Keelan over at Matita Conk. I owe a lot to him. And then David Pletzner, I've done some TPI work with him. And it definitely got me ready for this upcoming season. And early in the year, the game was, you know, showing some good lights. I, 
I, I, I qualified for the match play championship. Unfortunately, you know, I had to play Danny Lewis in the first round and, you know, playing Danny Lewis is like playing a birdie machine. And, and, you know, I didn't have my best stuff that day and Danny took care of me pretty, pretty well. And then, you know, we had the clam bake, which was our next major. And for me, it was, it was similar to the section championship. I, I laid an egg, you know, at Hollywood. I, I have always felt good on the golf course at Hollywood, but I didn't play very well in the clam bake. And, and that lit that fire again for me. And then the game started progressing nicely. Um, you know, I went and qualified for the state open, which you said, Mike, you know, for somebody like myself, that's an accomplishment just right there. And then, you know, with that, I think some confidence grew. There was a pro-am at Bayonne earlier in the year that, you know, I hit eight, I hit 14 out of 14 fairways and hit 18 out of 18 greens. Textbook. And, and that's, Textbook. Yeah. that's really <laughs> difficult to do on any golf course, yeah, no especially Bay, Bayonne. And, and that confidence grew. Uh, it's then, tough to do on a mini golf course. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and then, you know, I, I had a couple other rounds of under par and some things and, and the confidence continued to grow. And then, you know, the, the Monday of the state amateur here at the club, I, I'm nervous. How's Manasquan going to show not only as a, as a golf course, but what, what can we do to make sure the experience for everybody is to the highest standard. And that's, that's what we pride ourselves on here at the club. And, and I almost backed out of the head pro championship up until Sunday morning. I was, even talking to members here at the club, we had a tournament over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday leading up to the state amateur. And I remember having a conversation on the first tee with members, man, I, like, I'm not even going to be here tomorrow. I have the 36 hole head pro championship at Knickerbocker. And, you know, a lot of them said, everything is going to be fine. Like go to Knickerbocker, go play. Uh, so in all honesty, I got here at 430 on Monday morning of the state amateur. And I was here from 4.30 until 6.30, helping the State Golf Association get things ready. I got in the car, I had a 9 a.m. tee time at Knickerbocker. I got oh, up Jesus. there, you know, my phone was in the golf cart, all 36 holes. I kept hitting the refresh button because I kept looking at the scores at Manasquan River, not only for our players that were affiliated to the club, but how is the course performing? Because once again, I'm worried, is it gonna get chewed up? So I got to Knickerbocker, played well. Um, I shot one under par, you know, or two under par, uh, 70 in the first round, which had me tied for the lead uh, with about three or four other guys. And, you know, for me, that was a different spot in a big time event. You know, we took a break at, at and had some lunch and we were going back out for the, for the second round of the day. And for me, it was different. And all of a sudden you had, you know, people from the New Jersey PGA with your group doing live scoring. And, you know, I played well. I made, I started on the 10th hole in the afternoon and I made a birdie right out of the gate and then made some bogeys, but then regrouped and made a couple other birdies and made the turn. And I think I looked at my phone for the first time looking at the head pro championship. And at the time I was one back and then I birdied one and two when I made the turn. And I think I took the lead. Uh, made made a bogey somewhere in there. And then Ryan Fontaine from Baltusrol, who ultimately won the event, started making some birdies. And I, I remember going to the ninth hole, the final hole, and I was sitting at two under and Ryan was at three under for the event. So I was at even par in that second round and Ryan was at um, one under for the second round. And he was about two groups behind me. And I, I had a pretty easy wedge shot in the middle of the fairway on nine at Knickerbocker. And I hit a really good wedge shot that went about 15 feet past the hole. And, you know, at green has a lot of slope to it. And I definitely ran at the birdie putt thinking that I needed to make it to possibly tie Ryan. You know, I ran it by, I didn't make the comebacker. So I finished with a bogey and finished at one under Ryan part in and ultimately won the event at three under, but it was a great experience for me. It was nice to be in the mix in an event like that. And then you fast forward to the state open and you witness what happened here in the state amateur. You look at the field and you have every big name that you had in the state amateur is now in that state open field. And then you add about 40 really good golf professionals to the field as well. And, you know, I'm showing up there at Hackensack, just happy to be there. 
Uh, I went out and I shot four over par in my first nine holes. It was very lackluster. It wasn't good. I made the turn. Thankfully, I shot even par on that final nine in the first round that kind of gave me a chance. And Kevin Dyer, my caddy, who's just a great guy, said to me, you know, after the first round, he's like, well, we got to come up here tomorrow and shoot under par. Uh, so I, I drove up there that next day. Uh, thankfully, I, I went out and I, I shot probably one of the best tournament rounds I ever did. It, it was a one under a par 71 that ultimately probably could have been, you know, a 68 or something like that. I, I had a three putt, you know, where I knocked it on a par five and two and I had a three putt from about 15 feet and missed a short one on the last hole as well. But thankfully that one under par was good enough to make the cut on the number. And, and that was one of the better rounds of the day. When I look back at the second round, a lot of the numbers were higher than the first round to see you come back and go under par in that second round. When I looked at that leaderboard and I looked at all the numbers, it was like 72, 73, 74, and it was on the higher end. So for you to be able to still go out there, regroup, post a number under par, and then that rain delay happening, I remember texting you like, I think you're in. Like, I, I think you're in looking at where everybody was, what everybody still had to do. And then to make the cut going into that last day, like. I know that last day was sweltering and it was as hot as I probably, you probably can think about playing golf. Like, what was that like? Yeah. So in, in all honesty, I drove up there and I still didn't know if I was going to make the cut or not because people were still finishing their second round that, that Wednesday morning. And, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be texting and driving, but I was refreshing and driving <laughs> you know, the whole way up. I actually had, you know, Kevin, my caddy in the car, and I had Austin Devereaux, our director of outside operations in the car with me. Thankfully, Austin was at even par, so he was comfortably gonna make the cut. And I, I just kept refreshing and, you know, it started to look better, better, but then at some times guys made some birdies and it wasn't looking good. But by the time we pulled into Hackensack, it looked comfortable that I was gonna make the cut. And, and that was exciting. And I, I mean, I pulled in there at 1130 and all of a sudden my tee time wasn't gonna be till two o'clock. So you, you, you kind of sit around and you wait a little bit. You don't wanna start your warm up routine too early, but then the pairing comes out and I'm paired with Bill Hook, who's you know the director of golf and GM at, at Knickerbocker. And Billy's a, a great friend of mine and just a great guy. And you know we're looking forward to going out there in a twosome and just having some great fun. And, and Mike, to say it, I mean, hot was an understatement. Uh, I'm not the, the smallest guy in the world, you know, so it probably bothers me a little bit more than it bothers, you know, the, the young whippersnappers that are in tip top shape. But, you know, I went out and uh, I feel your pain there. <laughs> no question. Uh, you know, I went out and, and I played a good solid front nine. I, I, I made, you know, I, I turned at even par and you know, you're not looking at the leaderboard and you know, at this point, everybody in the field's playing really good golf. So you don't think you're moving up too much, but when it comes to the professionals in the field, maybe you are and you're, you're climbing the leaderboard. And, you know, then I made the turn and the first three holes making the turn, I, you know, I had a, a par, a bogey and a par, but the par was on a 260 yard par three right after a bogey on a reachable par five. So it was a nice little pick me up, but, but then whether it was heat or whether it was lack of focus, I, I got to the fourth tee box and I absolutely cold topped it with a three wood off the tee, just out of nowhere. I, it's been a long time since I've done that in regulation, but it, in tournament competition, but it shows that it could happen to anybody. And from there I made some bogeys coming in, but all said and done, the week for me was, was very special. Uh, the goal was to be in the field. Once you get in the field, I think you're, you're fortunate to be there, but I think you have realistic goals and that goal was to make the cut. And I was excited to do that, to play alongside that final day with, you know, 40 of the best players in the state, whether it's professional or amateurs, to think that I was even part of that, you know, is kind of a pinch yourself moment and exciting. I, I've played in, I've played in eight state opens and that's only the second time I've made the cut. So for me, it was special, no doubt. Um, and then you, you asked the question about the section championship. So, I mean, top 12 is, I mean, that, knowing like where the game is at and it feels like it's on a, you know, incline going in the right direction, you've got to feel like, I mean, I don't know what your goals are, but you have to look at top 12 and say like, God, like I, I, I'm right there. I'm, I'm right there. I'm one shot here. I'm one little mistake here. I'm one mental lapse here from 
God, I can get top 12. I mean, that's got to be on your radar, no? Yeah. Uh, the section championship is at Mountain Ridge this year, which is just an incredible facility, an incredible golf course. Uh, so fortunate to their membership to allow us to come play that championship there. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the excitement levels there, you know, from now until the section championship, I don't have any other events. Um, the Met Open will be held towards the end of August. I had the Met Open qualifier the other day. I shot 73 at Suburban, 71 was needed. It would have been nice to get in that field, but you know, I'm a little golfed out right now. So, you know, to, to miss the Met Open, you, you wanna be in the field, but to miss it, you got a little downtime. We're obviously gonna be busy here at the club. We have club championships going on right now. And then we have some one day member guests and some other things. So I could devote my time to the club and then come early September, we'll regroup, uh, we'll get out there to Mountain Ridge and we'll give it our best. I, I think I'll spend some time with Keelan over at Matita Conk, maybe a lesson or two leading up to the section championship and just try to fine tune some things. But, you know, to me, Mountain Ridge is a very similar golf course to, ha uh, to Hackensack. You know, it's not the most penal off the tee. It's, it's generous off the tee. It's a big boys golf course. You know, you bomb it and uh, you try to, you know, hit it on the greens and make some putts, but uh, it's not too demanding on accuracy off the tee. So I feel strongly about my chances. And, and yeah, Mike, I mean, top 12 is certainly the goal. I, th I think you start the week trying to play good golf. And if you make the cut, hopefully on that last day, you could try to shoot a good number and climb up that leaderboard and try to get to that top 12. And I've never played in a national club pro, and that's always been my goal uh, to qualify for one of those. So for me, if I could do it this year, that would be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah. You haven't qualified yet. Yet. That's one of my big things. Like I haven't done it yet because it's going to come to a time when it happens and you're going to say, yep, now is my time. And listen, I hope it happens then for you. Um, I, I will say this either way. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you having us out here. It's, I, I, I joke with Mike quite a bit about it. I give him a hard time, but uh, just from walking this place for the state am, it is a special place, and I'm looking forward to seeing it from, again, from being on the course and, and playing it. Um, I really feel very fortunate and humbled that, you, that you're having us here. I really, I'm really excited about today. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a no-brainer for us. You got, the two of you are doing incredible things for the game of golf, and I think you're showing some great light to professionals like myself and you're showing great light to strong amateur players and just the game and golf in general and to have you guys out here it's actually an honor of ours and we look forward to the day and just keep doing what you guys are doing because you know when i talk to my colleagues and when i talk to strong amateur players everybody's listening and they're enjoying it every week i listen every week and uh what you guys are doing is great so it's the least we could do is have you out here for a great afternoon at manasquan river golf club well I appreciate it. Let's go have it. some fun. Let's go hit them. Let's do it, guys. Yeah.